Hi everyone and welcome to this KubeCon session. Today we're going to have the CNCF end user community tell us a bit about their experiences and challenges with adopting cloud native. So my name is Cheryl, I'm VP of ecosystem at the CNCF and I primarily work with the CNCF end user community. So this community is a group of nearly 150 companies who are all talking about and discussing what are the challenges that they're facing with cloud native. And the idea behind this community is to have a vendor neutral safe space where people can share their honest opinions. So today I'm very honored to have four guests who are joining this panel, who are representing different companies within the end user community. So let's introduce ourselves. So to start with, as I've already said, my name is Cheryl and I'm at the CNCF. I am Jennifer uh, Strajevich. I work for Condanast. I am a site reliability engineer. Hi, my name is Casper. I work at a company called Lunar, also as a site reliability engineer. Hello, my name is Ken Owens. I work at MasterCard and I lead uh, cloud native engineering and platform teams. And hi, um, my name is Lee. I'm an engineering manager at Spotify. Awesome. So Jennifer, Casper, Ken and Lee, thank you so much for joining. So I'm going to start with some questions and We'll just have a chat. We'll just discuss what your thoughts are. So let's start with which cloud native principles that you adopted were the most beneficial and which ones caused the most concerns for your organization? And Lee, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so I guess the, the, the most important one, going back a few years ago, I was working at a, a company called Frog and we were basically mi migrating from on-prem uh, uh, service service to um, a, a cloud native design. Uh, and the, the most important thing I think for us was designing um, upfront with automation in mind. Um, so that allowed us to, to like improve uh, our monitoring. Um, obviously CI, CD came with that, um, decoupling of concerns and basically improved security uh, from that aspect. Um, so that, that kind of up thinking about um, how we can automate, for example, the, the monitoring to then uh, resize stuff if, if, if things start filling up or uh, monitoring like CPU performance or, or all different kinds of aspects uh, and being able to react to it um, uh, really quickly. Um, it was also a little bit of a, a double-edged sword, to be fair. Um, I think that um, there was a level of trust that we had to gain uh, in doing that migration. Um, so people were used to kind of big, long um, deployment um, processes, uh, uh, allowing us to do like uh, lots of manual testing, that side of stuff. Um, so there was um, that was the, also the kind of the concern, if you will. Uh, from the same aspect. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. So uh, back when I joined uh, Luna in 2016, uh, we were called LunaWay at that time. We had a concept where we were sort of starting building microservices and we were so, sort of forgetting how to actually do the infrastructure. So they were still deploying everything as one big, uh, yeah, basically all, all all the microservices in one go. So we got none of the benefits and all the complex stuff uh, in, in doing that. So we, we also had a concept of uh, actually baking the infrastructure. So we baked the machines and, and just deployed everything in one go. That was a really big headache. So I think one of the most beneficial uh, things for us uh, in our transformation from, from that state to where we are now running uh, Kubernetes and, and, and 100 microservices has been definitely to come to a place where we can have uh, independent deployable services and, and sort of uh, get out of each other's way um, and, and stop coordinating across what version do, do we need to, to run and all of these microservices. It is, it's impossible to do when you run a lot of microservices. Yeah, Masako, we did you, did a similar you... kind of a scenario there as well with, you know, kind of looking at the abstraction of these services and how 
over time, the simplification of, of those abstractions has allowed us to really, you know, results in a, in a much faster and more agile deployment methodology. And I think some of the concerns that, that you know, we ran into at MasterCard had a lot to do with sort of up-leveling our skill sets and helping, uh, you know, teams were not really um, thinking in abstract ways and not taking advantage of the microservices concepts, you know, like you were talking about Casper as well. And so we sort of had to kind of help, you know, train up the, the different teams, both on the infrastructure side, but also on the development side to really understand how to do this well. Yeah, and in common ask the current... Oh, sorry. I, no, I, I, I was uh, I was more a, I, I think I just a, a short question for for Casper in in that shift from kind of people being used to deploying like big monolithic um, product um, if you will um, and switching to microservices did you have to do any kind of like did you have to do anything special to to help build up the trust between all of the dis different squads that like you know service a is fine to deploy. I don't know what's in it kind of thing. It's that other team over there or was it fairly straightforward shift? It was actually fairly straightforward. We, however, encountered a lot of concerns when sort of moving a lot of um, sort of the uh, shifting left in the sense of uh, having our developers do a lot of uh, more infrastructure. So we basically went uh, the completely sort of the opposite way of having you know, back then we had we, before we had this big uh, mono, uh, just one repo, everything was in there, and they started to split everything up. And now we we sort of got in the direction of now we need to everything needs to be sort of centralized in their own repository. All all each service needs to own everything, Kubernetes uh, manifest, all of the stuff, um, which was a big concern for our developers because they really didn't want to learn all of all of these things and. Uh, so we struggled a lot finding sort of the right abstraction, uh, as Ken also mentioned, that it, it's, it, yeah, it's been kind of hard to find sort of the right balance of how, how much do you want to, to hide for your developers and how much, or how can you present some sane defaults that they can just get out of the box um, when they're building their services and deploying them. Yeah, it's definitely a th similar thing with these, um the learning curve of uh, the developers and the shift of responsibilities as well. Uh, a developer having to, uh, they have the benefit of uh, being able to have flexibility. They can change the versions of their packages, but then they get the responsibility to uh, secure their containers in our case and uh, security scanning, things like that. So they have to worry about those things that they didn't worry before. So that's definitely a concern. But among the benefits uh, in Condanas case, uh, for example, now we are uh, migrating uh, various clusters across uh, two different companies that are emerging. So it's ma massively beneficial to have infrastructure as code and running on containers with Kubernetes. Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. So. Um, let's go to the next question. So the next question is, what were your multi-region challenges and trade-offs that involved cloud native principles? And Jennifer, do you want to start with this one? Sure. Yes. Uh, well, in our case, uh, one example that I can refer to is centralized logging. Uh, it is a big challenge to uh, replicate or uh, centralize in a global sense uh, your logs and that is was definitely a trade-off that we had to do uh, we did choose to uh, remain within a region level and the reason for that preference is that our uh, localized our websites are more localized and the troubleshooting and uh, in the majority of the times uh, is done within a region level so for example uh, if you have uh, a problem on Vogue Japan, it is most li likely that uh, we would be troubleshooting within a one AWS region context uh, in one sense. Um, I would like to know what uh, others have like thought of and uh, what were their, uh, the benefits and uh, trade-offs they had to do with that too. 
So I, I think I've in the past I've experienced a, a similar thing. Um, uh, when I was working at Amazon, we we were expanding out um, our uh, uh, across regions, and um, one of the things uh, that hit us was basically restrictions or licensing around uh, certain data that we could that we could share, and that's everything from. Um, like media information, if you will, through to things like GDPR impacted us in a similar way. Um, and, and prior to this shift out kind of regionally, there was, um, it was easier uh, and more observable um, to, to kind of scan across all of those, uh, all of that data sets. But then as we, we started to, to go into more regions, we started to elevate basically that uh, licensing and, and restriction, uh, regional restrictions data, uh, metadata out. Uh, so it's a similar trade-off. We ended up with like one central place where you could go and, and for, for stakeholders easily search through. Uh, how do you search, how, how did you search through them? Did you have a different, uh... Uh, portal to search each region uh, or did you could you do it from one place but actually scanning different it, yeah so it's um basically we we some of the made uh, metadata we have elevated up and created a, a centralized tool that basically you could go to one place and then basically select the the region or area that you were looking into and then that would then go and pull data from a, a different source and uh, escalate into that one source. But uh, again, it was kind of similar to what I do now at, at, at Spotify. It was kind of productivity engineering, if you will. Um, so it was providing those internal tools to help help the stakeholders uh, through that, that process. Casper, can yeah, for, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, just uh, for, for our case at Luna, we uh, we are very focused in, in the Nordics, so we are not uh, running multi-region in, in that sense. Um, we do, however, do backups and stuff to, to other regions, but but that's um, primarily that. So we, we are not sort of sending data across uh, regions. Um, so I, I have a, don't have anything sort of to, to add to that. Um, we don't have that uh, issue yet. <laughs> And how about Ken? Yeah, so at, you know, at Masco, we have a lot of multi-region deployments. And I think our biggest trade-off was, was trying to manage the upgrade process across the multiple different regions and then sort of the, um, the rolling updates that we were trying to accomplish and ensuring that all of the different dependent, you know, microservice components were able to support the rolling upgrade type of model. And that was, that was a challenge in and of itself, as you all experienced. Okay, great. Let's go to our next question. So what is something that you've experienced that could have been avoided if you adopted cloud native? And Casper, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. So uh, coming back to what I was talking about earlier about, uh, so when you go microservices, don't uh, don't forget about uh, the infrastructure that you need to support all of these microservices and think that in from the beginning. I think that was uh, was one of the, the, the big things that I learned at, at Lunar uh, when I, I joined is that we you really need to think about the infrastructure uh, and just just don't go, hey, microservices, I heard this is a, the way to do stuff uh, and just build a lot of microservices and then just forget about the uh, the runtime and the infrastructure that needs to support all that. I think that's uh, that's a, a, a thing that I would uh, recommend uh, people uh, really understanding before getting into uh, to doing microservices. Was there a specific story or experience that you had? Casper? We just had, uh, you know, just a lot of uh, coordination between teams, um, needing to ensure that all the different versions of these microservices were sort of aligned and could run together. And and then just, you know, the the big, uh, it took around 45, 50 minutes to, to bake a new sort of version of our infrastructure. Um, and that was just a pain. So I, I really like uh, that quote, if, if it hurts, do it often. Um, and that was one of the, the reasons why we sort of uh, ripped that thing apart and, and ad adopted Kubernetes. And, and that was 
primarily the main reason why we, we adopted uh, Kubernetes as a, as a platform was to, to sort of find a way for us to, um, to get independent deploy, deployable services, basically. Jennifer, I saw you smile a moment ago. Have you had the same experience? Uh, uh, well, um, well uh, we in Condé Nast, uh, in the project that we started, we, we had a cloud native in mind, but despite uh, practicing those uh, uh, techniques like uh, using infrastructure as code uh, with tools such as Terraform, Helm, um, we still had uh, issues with not practicing fully. Uh, for example, uh, when we had to do some uh, uh, an upgrade of uh, traffic ingress controller, um, we had some uh, cleanup tasks that were done manually and uh, uh, the environments weren't uh, 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 mirrored uh, as a saying this way. Uh, and then when we deployed to production, we had an incident that was an issue with the deployment, uh, but we couldn't see that on staging because of these, some bits were not cleaned up in, in some environments. And uh, the lesson learned here is that even though it may take longer comparatively to uh, for a cleanup task to be done via doing a pull request, uh, a review, and then you put all through the pipeline, which is the way that we have set up, uh, uh, by sticking to the version declarative changes, we are avoiding this these human errors that are normal. So there is this cultural side as well of some practices that we have power to do, but if we stick to the transparent way, the pipeline, we we will avoid them and the the the, the reward is much higher in that case. So Lee, do you have anything yeah. to add? Um yes, I guess the 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 thinking back to the question, I guess the, the one that springs up for me was I, I once managed to take out most of our uh instances we were in. So the the example that I mentioned up at the top around we were going through this transition from kind of on-premise to, to cloud native. Um and we deployed a, a new region, we'd gone, you know, all in it was containerized and 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 all of this cool stuff. And I was migrating some code from, from our old, old system. Uh, and the thing that springs to mind is, is managing state. <laughs> um, and our old system, there was parts of it that were super tied to, for example, the box it was running on, how many threads were available and, and all of this stuff. Um, and moving that into kind of the cloud native um, uh, setup that we'd got, um, I hadn't checked um, what this this code was dependent on, um, and it um, basically took out a few instances. Um, so I learned the hard way. Um, so I guess the the big learning for me was, um, yeah, at, th at that time, be be mindful about um, like if it's stateful or, or trying to be stateless. Cool, and Ken. Do you have any experiences that could have been avoided through cloud native? Yeah, we yeah, Mastercard definitely has, has learned some good lessons um, during our trans, transformation towards cloud native. And I think the probably the biggest one, you know, is kind of you know what we've talked about already today, but a little bit different in that um, a lot of the, the different you know excitement that the developers have and, and some of the processes that, that Jennifer mentioned that were you know, and the culture that needed to kind of change was, was that once it was adopted, um, some of the old habits crept back in, right? Like hard coding to services and not understand version, you know, the, the service team that developed the new service. And in this example, I'm thinking about, they didn't, you know, quite understand how to kind of make sure that they're um, doing release management with the version correct, right? And so, um, you know, you can, you can take down another team's set of services by not, you know, correctly doing, you know, versioning of your service. And so I think our, our biggest lesson was to make sure that you improve and understand, you know, how to do release management and, and versioning as you roll out, you know, the new services, because that otherwise if you have kind of a, a new way of rolling something out, but trying to manage it the old way, uh, you're going to run into to issues for sure. 
Yeah, I can, I can yeah, relate a lot to that as well. Uh, so we we uh, re adopted a GitOps uh, a year and a half ago or something like that, and in the process of we, we, so just to give some context, Lunar is uh, sort of a fintech transitioning into a bank, and all of the, the requirements coming with that um, really sort of um, required us to, to be very declarative and, and, and just see all the changes um, coming into our environments and having sort of a, a concept as, as GitOps where you declare all your stuff, you have some rec uh, reconcilers running in your environments, uh, sort of recon reconciling the state in, the, in, in that repository has been sort of a really aha moment for us that we can get uh, audit and, and all of that and, and get a really nice workflow for our developers as well. Um, uh, just doing some, some small tweaks to our pipeline, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's go and now talk about a different direction. So how does membership in the CNCF end user community factor in your a factor into your ladder or professional development paths for the participants from your organization? And Lee, why don't you start? Sure, can do. Um, so actually, this is something that we, uh, for, for me particular, I guess, and, and um, my team tribe at Spotify, uh, we're really kind of trying to focus in on at the moment. Um, so Spotify's obviously been involved in, in open source in, in all sorts of different shapes and sizes over um, many years. Um, but right now, uh, the teams that I'm in are, are super focused on that. Uh, we're, we're trying to open source the, uh, the main products that we're doing. Um, and as, as part of that, we're trying to embrace the, the community more and, and kind of learn from that and incorporate that back in. Um, and that's doing things like um, we're looking into uh, like um, open source internship programs um, to help kind of um, newcomers in, into Spotify and um, gain experience working in open source um, and working with the community and, and how that kind of differs from the ways, the ways that we've worked internally. Um, we're also kind of trying to bring in obviously things like new trainings. Uh, we're trying to incorporate more and more of um, kind of open source into um, kind of recognition internally for, for, for people, um, you know, and include that when we start to, to talk about progression and, and next steps and, and things like that and basically celebrate um, people taking part in it. Um, I'd be super interested to hear what, what other people are, are doing too. Jennifer, I can, uh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Shall I? Okay. Uh, uh, well, to me, uh, I echo everything that Lee said as well. And I add that um, also being uh, a member and attending the meetings and uh, dealing with the decisions for uh, new projects uh, also help people who are interested in advancing their technical leadership skills and uh, exercise their ability to look ahead uh, it's important for the organization to have someone that comes and, and proposes new things and is always listening to the community out, out there and comes with fresh ideas, um, uh, encourages us also to push them forward in our organizations. We have a more confidence by listening to the community. And uh, I think also there is uh, something to learn from the processes used, uh, how you share the ideas and uh, how you make sure everyone is heard. I find it very really good. Yeah, we, we, we haven't been that structured uh, <laughs> in our sort of uh, setup yet. Uh, we, uh, as mentioned, we're coming from a startup. Uh, we are not that many people yet. Um, however, we have been from, from the get-go, been very sort of involved in the community, uh, especially around uh, the local community in, in the city where we were located because we we knew that this was we were pretty early uh, adopting uh, Kubernetes back then and we, we wanted some some local people to start talking about uh, these things and just share experiences and ideas and and later join the uh, the end user com community as well um, also trying to um, from our learnings, try to uh, do, do blog posts, uh, open source, whatever we can open source. Um, 
uh, of course we can cannot open source uh, some some of the banking stuff and some of the more sort of local uh, stuff we have running but about all of our infrastructure tooling and and whatever we do sort of in that area for our platform that's something that we we try to uh, to to publish uh, and talk about as much as possible because i think there's a lot of value in sharing our experiences and and just hearing other people talk about how they are doing it it's uh, it's been really really valuable and 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 uh, yeah, and and just as as Jennifer mentioned, just coming up in the forefront and and knowing what's going on in the community and and bring that back into uh, to your own organization to yeah to see if if that's a, a new project for for us to uh, to adopt um, to gain some more velocity or whatever it, it might be. Yeah, that's that's really I think important. You know, at, at Mastercard, we we really tied into that end user. Um, community and the engagement we have with other end users to really help shape and form what we kind of call a, a training pathways or, you know, development and learning pathways for cloud native and, you know, for, um, for how to develop and kind of modify development for a more cloud native model. Um, we also have used the CNCF landscapes a lot. So as we look at, at filling gaps in our technology portfolios, um, we bring in the landscape and talk about the different projects, um, not just the ones that are in the you know CNCF sandbox and incubating efforts, but also you know the ones that are just listed as uh, uh, projects that may be of interest to us to engage in. And that kind of had this interesting side effect of a lot of our developers getting excited about these different you know projects and what they're working on, which then in turn you know create we developed a you know open source model to kind of get you know developers engaged with the community and then they started you know um, providing you know contributions back to the community which then has led to you know to more open source you know um, methodologies being enforced and, and coming into the organization which has been awesome to see um, the other thing we do is we also like to do a lot of recruiting at KubeCon and you know so we you know we're always looking for great full-time employers and employees and internships and we are hiring so let me know if you're interested in looking at Mexico. There is another That's good reason to be part of the CNCF piece of community too, right? You can you are you are out there, you put your name out there and talk about what you're doing and then you attract the talent that's interested in that too. So <laughs> It's a win-win. Yeah, for sure. And I'd love to hear that the, your companies are actively encouraging open source contributions because that's how everything works within cloud native. So let's go to the next question. So did your developer experience and satisfaction change after the adoption of cloud native and Casper? Do you want to talk first? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so but back when we, we sort of started this, uh, we had a lot of discussion around what, what is the right abstraction for our developers? How do, do they develop uh, these microservices locally? How do they build their containers? Uh, do they need to run the environments uh, on their machines? We, in the beginning, we tried out with running in the beginning, six microservices in Minikube, and that was fine. Then we had 20 services, then it became a little bit harder. and and then we just gave up at some point because, yeah, that, we, we couldn't run all of these services and uh, locally. So we, we needed to find a, 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 another way to, to sort of, you know, uh, have a good developer experience when building uh, microservices in a cloud native um, ecosystem or, or platform. So, and I don't think we really found the good solution yet. We, we tried to sort of um, minimize the time it takes to deploy to one of our development environments. So it, it, for a developer to, to get their changes out there, it, it's about three minutes or something like that. Uh, but we have focused a lot in on writing tests and, and having our developers testing a lot more uh, locally and, and write as much as possible uh, that they can do locally. And then they can, of course, push to, uh, to a development environment to test it fairly quickly. But I'm, I'm kind of interesting to, interested to hear how, how you are sort of addressing developer experience and how uh, your developers are sort of seeing this uh, adoption of cloud native and what they think of it. So I, I can talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, right now at Spotify. Um, so we, we've had, a, we, we kind of uh, have, 
that we, we, we've kind of built alongside uh, as we've been uh, adopting more and more like uh, cloud na native um, frameworks and platforms and things like that. We've actually been trying to uh, build a, a platform alongside of it, focusing on on tooling. So when it comes to uh, like developer productivity, you know, maybe we can't deploy everything all on, on one person's laptop, but we can provide lots of other kind of productivity optimizations through uh, like a, a centralized uh, plugin framework that, that, that my team is producing at the moment where everyone can plug in like various bits of tools, be that something to do with, with Kubernetes and helping to, to smooth that process all the way through to CI, CD tooling and, and everything else in between. Um, and that's uh, the, the internally within in Spotify, that, that gave us a, a, a really good uh, advantage, I think, uh, in, in like developer engagement and, and if you will, happiness. Um, from from the day to day, and that's what we're now working to to open source uh, and and try and support the rest of the community doing the same type of thing. Um, and I think the 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 thing that that kind of lines up alongside that is adopting like CNCF technologies or, or uh, looking at the landscape there. It gives uh, developers a. a common language, if you will. So rather than working on specific uh, frameworks or, or uh, projects to Spotify, um, you know, working on Kubernetes is, is, as an example, is something that like other engineers and other companies can relate to. And there's a bigger, wider community there that they can engage with. So kind of the adoption of those and then trying to supplement that alongside it seems to have, have really improved and helped the developer experience for us. Jennifer, how about a comment uh, asked? Uh, yes, well, uh, the organization, our organization started with Cloud Native in mind, uh, the new Conanast International. And there was uh, a change in developer experience because we had new teams coming from different companies and uh, most people didn't have this uh, DevOps uh, mindset uh, cemented in their minds, but they were very welcoming. But uh, of course, uh, we had to, we are still collaborating together and it's meant for us to all uh, work together. And similarly to Lee, uh, building tooling uh, that will help people across the board, not individually supporting teams. So it's thinking ahead of uh, accelerating uh, for everybody. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, now the teams are more mature after about three years that the project started and uh, appreciative of being able to uh, have more flexibility with their applications. So it's been very positive. And now with the merger that I mentioned, uh, there is a, um, another interesting challenge because the uh, other organization had uh, a different way to deploy systems. They had a more self-service click button uh, system that did much more. So we are uh, looking now at the benefits of having more flexibility and having uh, less uh, ownership, but wanting to merge and having giving this option if someone just wants to throw that application and deploy really quickly a small thing or, and, or if someone wants to be able to write their own like Docker file. So we are working through this challenge right now into creating one uh, deployment system that will satisfy these two culturally different sides, but uh, benefiting everyone. Awesome, thank you. And I think we can finish up now, but I'd just like to give everyone the chance to say any last thoughts. So for me, I found this a really interesting conversation and I'm really happy to see more companies are incentivizing their engineers to work with the open source community. Jennifer? Uh, well, uh, well, thank you for everyone. And uh, I believe that we should Yes, like trust to follow uh, the guidelines that we have uh, from like the community, but at the same time, uh, listen to you, to your teams, to your developers. They always have different challenges to to share, and uh, yes, let's keep learning. 
yeah uh, yeah and for me it's uh i think yeah li share your experiences it's it's really valuable just hearing the good the bad whatever you can share with the community it, it's it's really a great experience to learn from each other and and just get some feedback so i would really encourage people to to put whatever they have out there open source or just write a blog post or whatever just share it with the community because we all learn from it yeah, definitely. Just Ten. engage with the end user community from, from the CNCF if you can, and keep learning, adopting, and iterating. Uh, don't give up. Last word to you, Lee. Yeah, yeah and uh, just to echo what everyone else has been saying, like the community is is really really special. Um, you'll you you can give a lot and you can learn a lot from from the community. Um, so keep up that communication and. And I think as well, keep up the communication internally within your own uh, company, bring, bring everybody else along. Thank you so much to all of you. Really appreciate you chatting with me today. If you're interested in joining the end user community, please go to this URL. You can see on the screen, cncf.io slash people slash end user community. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining the Q&A session. So just to let you know, we're going to continue this in Slack afterwards in 2 kubecon case studies. So let me start with one of the questions we've got from Daniel Houston. So how have you felt your team structures and communications have changed as you've gone towards cloud native? Um, Casper, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So, as I mentioned in the recording, uh, in the beginning we had a lot of coordination uh, between teams uh, before sort of adopting cloud native. And uh, after and now, when we now have cloud native and Kubernetes and all that running, we can uh, ship uh, a lot of features without the teams getting in their way. They can go work on a feature for a couple of weeks and, and deploy that independently uh, most of the times without our so platform team getting involved, um, which is uh, super awesome to just see them build uh, what sort of brings value to, to us as a company um, and make that a part of us. Great, thank you. Um, Lee or Jennifer or Ken, do you want to respond about team structures and communications? I think I, I can say that like it, the switch, like to more micro microservices and, and cloud native and that side of things, um, effectively that allows the teams to be more impact orientated. Um, so rather than kind of having to keep up with, uh, kind of as Casper was saying, like the whole stack, um, we can focus in on our own impact areas and, and really own that end to end. And then communications, I think communications is still key, um, but the type of communications uh, kind of shifts a little bit. Um, more kind of like information blast, more keeping uh, stakeholders up to date that are maybe you've got dependencies or upstreams that are um, based off your, your services and systems. So you can be a little more targeted um, with, with those comps. Excellent. How about I go to you, Ken? Yeah, I think, you know, at Magico, we felt sort of the same, the same thing. Yeah, we, we felt some of the same things at MasterCard, and um, I think the really interesting thing for us was around the silos being broken down and teams working a lot closer together and a lot more collaborative together. Awesome. Jennifer, how about a Condé Nast? Uh, yeah, well, we aim towards uh, breaking those silos, and sometimes it's it's difficult. People see it as um, I, I still another team, like let's say the cloud platform infrastructure team and the developers. But we are trying to make like into one community. We we attend the same uh, meetings. We are the engineering teams, uh, but there are still lots of challenges to make it seem like a single practice that is like aimed at the same uh, goal. Uh, but yes, like it has improved a lot. We are uh, supported, we pair with them, we um, have channels for communications to support, but we are not a support team, let's say. Uh, 
yeah, it's like it's a constant learning uh, and iteration, I would say. Perfect. Um, I know we have a, a time limit here, so the rest of the questions I'm going to put into Slack so we can follow up on it. But let me try and get one more in. So I just saw one, Tony Wildish. Did you find any cultural resistance to changing cloud native and how did you address that? Lee, can I push that to you first? Sure. Um, any cultural resistance to, to going with cloud native? Um, I think, I think maybe it's not necessarily specific to, to going cloud native. Um, but I think the biggest thing was uh, kind of just change and risk of that change in the, in the like the core product that was, that was out there. Um, so kind of being able to take that in stages and take it in, in smaller steps. And then related to that, I guess, the, the change in process. Uh, people were used to working in a certain way, particularly like thinking around like the way we used to uh, QA stuff uh, back at Frog. Uh, and that was just, a, a again, a small like holding hands and, and, and working with people to make sure that the new stuff worked in, in a way that was suitable for them. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, Ken, how about a MasterCard? Yeah. Um, Ken, how about a MasterCard? Yeah, we had, we had a very similar experience your... to what Lee was describing. I think the, the process piece is something to not, you know, lose track of because it does, um, it does definitely involve a lot of, of change and a lot of work to get that right. Okay, um, Casper, let me ask the question to you. So did you get any cultural resistance to changing to Cloud Native? I think the, the most resistance we got was from uh, when we sort of uh, pushed everything out to developers and uh, that was I think we might have lost your audio at the end, Casper. So, sorry about that. Um, let me go to Jennifer and ask you the same question. I guess a similar thing. Uh, it's a bit scary to have, to, from one point, you are just focused on uh, thinking of the feature you have to deliver, and then you are suddenly responsible if you can't, if you can't, you, you need to monitor your application, you need to secure. Uh, you are responsible for it, and uh, there is sometimes uh, an assumption that oh, you will uh, an infrastructure team will build the dashboards, they will, and then you are like, well, and then you have to have this conversation of like cooperation, uh, as in, and uh, sell the idea that it's better that they have the whole power because they then don't depend on another team, and uh, there is. A, and it's more of like a collaborative thing. Um, yeah, these are challenges. Uh, it's like I said before, the teams are more mature now and we are more used to this uh, communication, uh, but it's still, uh, with, especially with merging and, and going with different teams, uh, this is happening and you will keep coming across that with new uh, teams. And, but but I, I think it's for better now and I think they appreciate after uh, after they they get to learn more and see that they are like now um, understand much more and for their careers as well like the knowledge of the whole life cycle and um, supporting monitoring your applications is, is is really good. Yeah, I definitely think it's a little bit easier today than it was a few years ago when cloud native was newer. I think more people know about Kubernetes now, so it's easier to persuade them that this is the right way to do things. Um, I think that we should wrap up there and then we will take the rest of the questions to Slack. So again, Casper, Jennifer, Ken and Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. And for everyone else, thank you for listening.